All right. So, um, so hi everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, this is, I think, number three um, webinar in our Lunch and Learn series on nonviolence in Oneida County. So, thank you all for joining us. Um, I've got Bailey Ewing with us here today, so I'll introduce her here in a second. Um, but just to kind of give you an idea of what we're how this agenda is going to flow today, is I'm going to ask that uh, any questions that you have that put those in the chat box for us. Bailey's got a lot of information to cover, so let's, let's allow her to get through the that. The way I see it, I have it highlighted. I know who has vaccines and who doesn't have vaccines. Okay, figured out who that was. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, so, um, so we're gonna go ahead and put the, uh, the questions. Anybody who has any questions, please put those in the chat box. And we'll get to those at the end of our webinar today, and then Bailey can address those at the end. Um, and then what we'll also do is if you could in your chat, in, in your question in the chat box, if you could reference, um, if you happen to notice what slide it is you had a question about, if you could put the number of the slide or at least the topic of what she was talking about, if you could reference that in your question as well, that would be helpful also for Bailey when we go back to uh, address those questions. Um, but a little bit about Bailey Ewing. We have been very fortunate to cross paths because Bailey was actually in our lead institute class our inaugural class from 2021. And since then, and, I, and I, Bailey, this is not in your bio, but I'm going to share it. She has been a number of um, nominees for Excellence in Leadership Awards and Professional Awards through Athena this year. Um, so she's doing marvelous and, and impactful things here in Medina County. So uh, let me share a little bit about you, um, about Bailey. She is currently, well, she's got a number of jobs. In addition to being a mother of three, three little girls and two dogs, which some of you got to see Moose earlier. He just, one here. Child. just one child and she's three, but she acts like oh. three and one. <laughs> well, okay. Uh, but she's currently the youth case manager for alternative paths. She assists youth and their families with receiving support and services through the schools, probation, the board of developmental disabilities, outpatient services and volunteer work. She helps to coordinate community mental health services to include counseling and pharmacy management. She's on her third year as co-chair for the Medina County Against Human Trafficking Coalition. And I know we've got a couple of those folks on the call today. She has been a member of the coalition for over five years. Just to admit Jim here. Um, and she's been involved in the Medina County middle, high, middle and high schools for the last three school years. She also sits in the Medina County Juvenile Detention Center community. <laughs> She's a volunteer for the Medina SP. She also has a horse too, right? <laughs> and as a 20, I mentioned she did graduate from her lead institute last year. Came from a background in law enforcement as a police officer and a juvenile detention officer in Medina County. Bailey has her bachelor's degree in justice studies from Kent State University, and she also completed the Ohio Peace Officer Training Academy through Kent State's Accelerated Summer Program. She currently resides in Medina, Ohio with her husband. Uh, her daughter, who's three, and two dogs, Hefty and Moose. In her spare time, she loves to go on trail rides with her horse, Dakota, or you'll find her spending time with her family. She's been a part of the Medina community for over 25 years, and she hopes to be a voice for the voiceless. So with that in mind, I will turn this over to Bailey, and I will pull up her screens for her, because I volunteered to do that for her, make it a little easier. And uh, we'll go through her presentation. Awesome. Well, welcome everybody. I appreciate you guys um, being a part of this lunch and learn. And I appreciate Terry for asking me to, to present this. I'm always excited when I get to um, talk about human trafficking because education is really the number one way we can put an end to this. Um, so a little bit about um, kind of what's gonna happen today is I condensed our normal human trafficking 101 into about 20 minutes or so. Um, I've been giving this presentation in about an hour to three hours. So this is, this is gonna be different for me as well. Um, for those of you that don't know, the coalition sits underneath the Children's Center of Medina County, which is a nonprofit. Um, they are located at uh, 724 East Smith. And really what the Children's Center is, it has three different pillars. Um, the first being the Child Advocacy Center, which provides um, forensic interviews for children under the age of 18 uh, who have been physically or sexually abused. 
They provide uh, forensic medicals as well, free of charge. Um, and that's completely different than a, an ordinary interview that you would think of um, with law enforcement or with a medical health professional. This is somebody who asks open-ended questions um, and is really talking about body safety. Um, those interviews are recorded and anybody who is part of their uh, multidisciplinary team of professionals has access to that interview so that child does not have to keep telling their story over and over and over again. Um, the second pillar is their human trafficking services. Um, and what that means is Terry, I think there's somebody unmuted that was causing some feedback. <laughs> um, so what the correlation between human trafficking services and the Child Advocacy Center um, is that there were risk assessments that were um, provided for the kids um, that were deemed high risk, meaning there was some sort of red flag with that. Uh, we have actually identified kids through that. About 91% of kids that um, were victims of human trafficking were actually sexually abused prior to that. So that's the huge correlation between um, the children, the Child Advocacy Center and human trafficking. The third pillar that is offered at the center is uh, the family foster care visitation. Those kids are have gone through some sort of neglect um, and those kids are also deemed high risk as well. Did you guys lose the screen too? Yes. Terry? I'm going to pull back up here. Okay. So back in 2014, um, the coalition was formed. Um, since the original members, which I believe were about 10, um, it has actually grown to about 75 people. Um, we have been able to sustain monthly meetings. Um, we have been working on having a January event. Uh, about three years ago, we added an October event. Um, and this year we had our first uh, poker run actually. Um, so we are looking at, at continuing that next year, um, but the coalition does sit underneath the Children's Center. So we are underneath their umbrella for that. Um, for the objectives for this, you guys are going to have a basic understanding of Human Trafficking 101, what it actually is. Um, and then we're also going to go over the Human Trafficking Risk Intervention Series um, this helps build re resiliency for our at-risk youth. It has been completed through schools as well as the detention center. <coughs> Terry, can we go to slide three, please? All right. So the main way we are seeing um, our youth being trafficked is through a process of online grooming. Um, this is really what we're seeing with our at-risk youth here in Medina County, as well as what I've heard from other counties in Ohio. Um, this can take place in a short period of time or it can continue for a very long period of time. It usually starts off as innocent. There's some sort of common interest with that. Um, they're going to establish some sort of um, relationship, whether that's lying about age, lying about interests, um, who, they, who that person actually is. Um, when I talk to the kids about this, we usually go over examples from the show Catfish. Um, and we usually have a lot of questions about how people can pretend to be somebody else for you know, seven plus years and that person is completely convinced they're exactly who they say they are. Um, they're going to make you believe that they're the only person that cares about you. Uh, once they have that affection, once they have that, that relationship built, um, you know, the child might have a fight with their guardian, with their mom or dad, and use that person as their venting person. Um, the conversations could take a more sexual turn after they feel like they've gained that trust from that, from that youth. They'll also use a lot of flattery and compliments um, to kind of win that person over. And when we look at um, our middle school and high school kids, um, especially the middle school, we have found online safety to be more of an issue. 
um, when talking with the school so much that actually Buckeye created an online safety um, part of their curriculum. So it's a nine week course that they're doing and they really, really hone in on this, on this component. Can we go to the next slide, please? At any given time, there are over 750,000 predators online. Um, that doesn't mean 750,000 total. That means I go on right now, that's 750,000. I go on in three hours, that's 750,000. Um, these predators could be on social media websites. They could be on um, any sort of chat forum. And what we're seeing a lot too um, is the gaming apps where you're able to talk with strangers and kids have their phones or their Chromebooks. But also when kids are using their Xboxes or PlayStation, um, one of the first questions I'll ask them is how many of you guys play games? Um, how many of you guys have actually met every single person you talk to on your headset? Um, and astonishingly, it's, it's not very many that actually have met all of these people in real life. Can we go to the next slide, please? Does anybody want to take a guess on the, well, I guess you guys can see it. Uh, what is the global net profit of human trafficking every single year? Um, if we could go to the next slide. It's actually 150 billion. Um, it is number two for illegal trade profits. The first being drug trafficking. Um, as of right now, they only differ by a couple million dollars. And I'm saying that with an M and not a B. Um, I believe it's, it's actually higher and it's surpassed drug trafficking. And here's some of the reasons why. If we could go to the next slide. When we're looking at $150 billion, we're only looking at the aspect of money. We are not looking at the exchange of what? food or shelter yes, um, it is. or even drugs. We've seen human trafficking, and drug trafficking go hand in hand. Um, this is not even taking into account material goods. Um, there could be exchange of purses or cars or cell phones, things like that. Um, so in my opinion, it's actually surpassed that. If we could go to the next slide. All right, so what is human trafficking? Um, the actual definition of it is fraud, coercion, or force of a human for the purpose of labor or commercial sex exploitation. Um, when we're looking at the differences between the two types of human trafficking, we're gonna go over the legal de definitions of the two. You're gonna see fraud, coercion, and force. Um, think violence, lies, and threats when you see those three words. And that's really what it boils down to. We could go to the next slide. There are two types of human trafficking, um, although there is a proposal to have a third. Um, the third would be actually arranged marriages, um, but we can get into that another day. Um, if we could go to the next slide. The first is labor trafficking. Um, this can include anything from domestic service to hospitality, um, agricultural work, um, farmlands, things like that construction, nail salons, um, restaurants, sweatshops, factories, and even massage parlors. Uh, we're also seeing a rise in casinos for labor trafficking as well. So we could go to the next slide. The second being sex trafficking, and this includes prostitution, pornography, strip clubs, truck stops, mail order brides, and again, massage parlors. Next slide, please. This is the legal definition of labor trafficking that I'm not going to bore you with and read it out loud, but I just want to draw your attention to the three underlying words, force, fraud, or coercion. Next slide, please. Um, an example would be if a woman takes in her niece when she becomes an orphan and tells her she has to cook and clean seven days a week without pay. Um, she's not allowed to be outside. She's not allowed to be engaged in school. She doesn't have any friends, no contact with the outside world. Um, this would be an example of labor trafficking, which is very, very similar to the story of Cinderella. Um, this would also be, I, I believe my kids have told me that this is the movie Tangled as well. Kind of expected or needed or... Well, we could go to the next slide, please. Probably. 
there probably by two. <clears throat> This is the legal definition of sex trafficking. Again, force, fraud, or coercion is underlined there. Next slide, please. An example that we have seen uh, many, many times in Medina County, um, an older male tells a runaway teenage girl that he wants to be her boyfriend and take care of her. He sets her up in an apartment, starts buying her expensive gifts, um, starts grooming her for what he believes next is the plan. Um, once he gains her affection and her trust and she has lost connection with her family, um, he will then tell her, I want to keep providing this lifestyle to you, um, but I have no money. Oh, by the way, I know how you can make this, this money. I need you to start sleeping with other guys. Oh, by the way, if you don't, I'm going to hurt your friends. I'm going to hurt your family. I'm going to hurt you. Um, another example would be what we've kind of seen too with the rise in um, our drug crisis is having that, that single mom with a teenage daughter, she has a live-in boyfriend. Um, the boyfriend is providing the roof over their head. He's providing groceries, working a job. Um, mom turns a blind eye to him having sex with her daughter. That would be an example of, of sex trafficking as well. Next slide, please. Some of the vulnerability factors that, we're, that we can look at is unemployment, um, needing that, that sort of financial stability, age, um, the average age for uh, victims of human trafficking when they first enter is actually 14 to 16 years old. Um, it was two years ago, it was 12 to 14. So that is why we really were pushing for online safety for middle school age children. Um, poverty, as well as crime, political conflict, whenever you have large elections happening, presidential elections, um, where you have a big group of people gathering, you're going to see a rise in human trafficking as well. A lot of times it's a culturally accepted practice to treat women and children like property. Um, the LGBTQ community, I've had some questions on this particular community as to why they would be most vulnerable, um, which is an excellent question. When we're looking at kids that don't have the support from their family um, as they're coming out, identifying with this community, they might turn to an online friend and get that support and end up building that relationship that way. History of child sex abuse or assault, having that low self-esteem or depression, um, a troubled home or a foster home. Again, I've had questions on this as well, um, which are always great questions. For these types of situations, a lot of times the child is placed with a foster home or in a group home that is outside their school jurisdiction or away from family or friends. So they've lost their crucial support and have trouble finding quote unquote, the right crowd of people um, and can turn to online friends. They can turn to, you know, different groups of people that might cause them some sort of harm. Runaways, um, drug and alcohol is, is linked with human trafficking as and mentally disabled is also a vulnerable um, community for uh, vulnerability factors. Next slide, please. These are our main recruitment techniques. Um, the boyfriend, which is also called the Romeo, um, recruitment technique is the romantic relationship. It could be, um, you know, a an older male with a younger female or even a younger male. Um, studies have found that at least one third of human trafficking victims are actually males. Um, there's also been other studies to support that it could actually be uh, closer to 50%. The daddy figure is also a, an older male who kind of fills in that role of the father figure. Um, the victim could be male or female. Finesse pipping is manipulating someone into thinking it's their own decision. Um, human trafficking has really became, become a uh, more of a game of manipulation rather than a game of force, which would be the gorilla pimping, which is extreme force to comply. Not saying that doesn't happen, but it is a lot easier to manipulate somebody than it is to force them day after day. The employer, aka bait and switch, um, this could be when people see posters on telephone poles, it says help wanted and lists the number. It doesn't tell you who they're looking for, what you would be doing, any sort of leads in that aspect. Um, again, not saying all of those posters are human trafficking, but that is a strong recruitment technique that they use. 
Um, they also, you know, there's stories of people being approached at malls and, you know, people being told, oh, you'd be perfect as a singer or an actress or a model. Um, anytime I talk to high school kids, I usually get somebody telling me this story. Um, and my response to that is we live in Ohio. Um, we're not exactly the capital of either of those. So what we really focus on is safety and numbers, always going with somebody, um, whether it's at the mall, whether it's a football game, there's always safety in numbers. And then the friend, which can look like a normal friendship. Um, it's usually another victim themselves, but they receive some sort of benefits for recruiting somebody else into the group. Um, next slide, please. So these are the recruitment locations that we have seen. Uh, they're schools, libraries, shelters, parks, um, JDCs, bus stops, abandoned buildings, malls, and parties. Um, when we're looking at libraries, um, I actually had an instance happen about two weeks ago with one of my kids um, where some stuff was actually posted, inappropriate um, stuff was actually posted on a library computer. Um, libraries are great for traffickers because they can wipe computers clean every single night. Um, so there's no trace of that. Um, also with, you know, we were talking about recruitment techniques with malls and parties. Um, those are huge. We did a training about a year and a half ago at Elyria High School. Um, the main reason we were asked to be there is they had two female students that thought it would be funny to be kidnapped because they wanted to see if they could outsmart um, somebody who would kidnap them. Um, we were advised by the school resource officer to discuss with them about certain hotels that they did not wanna see any underage kids at. These hotels were allowing high school parties, they were allowing drugs, they were allowing alcohol. Um, management was actually receiving financial compensation for having um, vulnerable students at this location. So it's, it's really all around us. Next slide, please. These are some of the red flags. Um, when we're looking at labor trafficking, the family relationship could not seem very clear. Um, typically the child will refer to their guardian as aunt or uncle. We typically don't see mom or dad. Um, this, this held true with one of the um, massage parlor busts that happened last year. Um, the children were calling their guardians aunt or uncle. Um, they could be excluded some, from family events, whether that's church, whether that's going out to eat at a restaurant. Um, they're going to also be physically exhausted and not, you know, when kids are staying up till 3 a.m. in the morning, physically exhausted, manual labor, physical exhaustion. They're going to typically be in a less desirable place in the house, whether that's a small bedroom or like a large closet. Um, they're also fearful of the family that they are with, um, and they're also they're going to respond um, and say that they're, they have to do their chores. That's usually what they call it. Um, when I was going over these red flags, I was giving this presentation at Medina High School, and I had a young lady come up and afterwards and talk to me about the labor trafficking red flags. Um, one of her cousins, she believed, was actually uh, being labor trafficked from her family. Um, she had stopped going to school. Uh, she was taking care of all of her siblings. She was responsible for meals. She was responsible for their, them doing their homework and she was the oldest child. Um, so we actually did open up a um, referral through CPS and that was completed. So um, kids are listening, they're listening to this information. Sex trafficking, um, somebody who has a large amount of cash on them, somebody who has a lot of hotel keys. It's very bizarre um, that you would see, you know, teenage kids with a bunch of hotel keys on them. They could be a chronic runaway. Um, again, we look at what are they running away from. They could be lying about their age or having a fake ID. Um, not saying every child who has a fake ID is a, is a trafficking victim, but that is a red flag. Um, inconsistent about their stories. They could have engaged in some sort of prostitution or commercial sex acts. Um, when we're looking at the term prostitution too, any child under the age of 18 um, cannot actually be a prostitute. That is, they're engaging in commercial sex acts and they are a victim of human trafficking. 
Um, any mention of a pimp boyfriend or daddy. In Medina County, it's more of the term fiance that we're seeing. Um, we've seen 14, 15, 16 year old girls who have 28, 29, 30 year old fiancés. Um, as a parent myself and knowing a lot of parents in the community, um, I know it would be very concerning to me if my teenage child came home and said that they had a fiance. Um, so that is a huge red flag for us. Next slide, please. So why do they stay? Um, it's very similar to a domestic violence um, relationship where you have that psychological conditioning um, that you feel like that person actually does love you and that's how they express that love. They could be threatened to harm to them or their families if they tell anybody. Um, a lot of times they could be familiar, unfamiliar with surrounding locations or even what country they're in. Um, we had somebody about five years ago and she didn't meet her quota and this was an adult. She didn't meet her quota and she was dropped off here. Um, United Way ended up helping her get, get you know, set up on her feet, but she had no idea where she was. Um, a lot of times they don't believe help exists or know where to find it. They could be fearful of law enforcement and other authority figures. Um, they're made to believe that law enforcement is going to arrest them, um, that they are the ones that did something wrong. And it is a lot easier to charge somebody with prostitution than it is human trafficking. Um, when we look at trying to actually go for somebody being charged with trafficking, a lot of times we're trying to push for that federal boundary just because it, it's a little bit easier um, to make sure that that person is gone for that, for that period of time. Um, they're unaware of their laws, culture, or language. They could have a drug addiction and in debt to their trafficker. Those two go hand in hand. Um, when we're looking at drug addiction, a lot of times our victims want to get addicted to something just so they can kind of numb the, the pain that they're going through so that they can kind of feel like they don't really know what's going on. Um, but also the trafficker will want them addicted to something so that they're continuously in debt to them. And also they believe that they are sending money home. Um, so the last two, they don't consider themselves victims and they blame themselves. Uh, we as a society are very victim blaming. When we look at um, hypothetically, if a female is uh, sexually assaulted, our society will sit there and say, what was she wearing? Why was she wearing so much makeup? Why did she get so drunk? Why did she put herself in that situation? Instead of looking at the offender. Um, this is not true for everybody. Um, I have seen, when I've given this presentation, we were talking about the Brock Turner case at uh, Cloverleaf High School. And I had a young man who, during our conversation about the Brock Turner case, he mentioned, well, why did she get so drunk? Um, so even our kids still think that way. Some of our judges still think that way. Um, so we are trying to really push for moving towards a more victim-centered approach rather than offender-centered. Um, next slide, please. So what can you do? Um, bring awareness to the issue by talking about it. Kids are listening. Um, they, really, I, they really are soaking up all of this knowledge. Um, just even saying, hey, do you know anything about human trafficking? A lot of times kids, when they first hear about it, they're thinking, oh, it's, it's happening overseas or I'll get kidnapped. Um, we've had multiple stories and calls about uh, honey on windshield and my vehicle was tagged, my vehicle was marked, I have zip ties on my mirror. Um, our attorney general has actually issued statements saying that none of that has actually been found to be accurate. Um, so a lot of times it's fear-based. Um, we, in our coalition, we call it inducing panic posts on Facebook. Um, just because traffickers are loving it, people are thinking, oh, look, we're looking at, um, you know, parking lots and who's following who, instead of looking at kids' cell phones, kids' Chromebooks, that's really where a lot of this is happening. Um, we're so focused on the outside world that we forget, you know, this is, this is a green light to trafficking. Um, volunteering at a local coalition event or attending a meeting, we are always taking volunteers. We are always looking for new members. Um, you don't have to be part of an organization. You can simply just live in Medina and just wanna be a part of it. And if you don't live in Medina or you're not affiliated with an organization in Medina, there are lots of coalitions out there for other counties. I'd be happy to connect somebody with that. 
Um, if you see any suspicious activity, um, calling 911 is the fastest way. We had a coalition member who was driving down the highway um, and had actually seen a truck pulling a horse trailer. Um, when he looked at the window of the horse trailer, there was a little girl that actually waved out of it and he didn't realize what he was looking at. Um, the fastest way for him to get a hold of somebody would have been 911. Um, being a mentor to at-risk youth, we partner with Rahab Ministries and they're always looking for mentors for, the, for their kids. Um, we do have one through our coalition and she'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have if you feel like you need to be connected with that. And the best thing you can do is if someone discloses something to you, the best thing you can do is believe them. Um, so many times we have seen kids tell a test person, they tell a snippet of their story and depending on that person's reaction, um, they either will disclose more or they won't say anything at all. And it's very hard to get to the bottom of it. Um, next slide, please. So the curriculum that we have been really pushing for um, is Cecilia's, um, Dr. Celia Williamson's curriculum. And it's basically focused on the complex risk factors for abuse, neglect, substance, substance abuse, mental health, and media. Um, it's very youth focused. Um, it's not, the first part of it is talking about human trafficking. It's a 10 week um, lesson course, but it really works on building resiliency, building up kids' confidence, if they have more confidence in themselves, they're less likely to be a victim of human trafficking. Um, next slide, please. So this is Dr. Celia Williamson. Um, she actually was, um, she's been doing the human trafficking and social justice conference for many years. Um, it's an international conference that they just actually had uh, last week. It's a three-day course. Um, and they talk a lot about human trafficking, but also the social injustices that we, that we face. Um, we were able to give this presentation um, very similar to this one, but a little bit different at the um, International Nova Conference in Orlando, Florida this year. Um, and we basically talked about this and what it means with at-risk youth, youth and what we have found to be um, kind of the outcomes from these, from these courses. Next slide, please. So these are the 10 um, topics that we, that we go over. Um, and I'll point out a couple to you. We're gonna go over the, the ones that we found to be truly successful with the kids. Next, please. We have used the HT risk course um, with many places here in Medina County, as well as Elyria High School. Um, we have been asked to come through all the high schools in Medina County. Um, we're still working with Brunswick on actually getting that curriculum in. Uh, we were set to, but unfortunately with the pandemic, it just caused a lot of, a lot of issues with us trying to get everybody in um, and then on the virtual aspects. Next, please. Number three, we have found to be really interactive with our kids. This is the risky situations. Um, basically having them see, assess, focus, evaluate, and react. Um, just kind of taking that deep breath and observe what, what's going on around them. We look at um, real life examples and how they can better equip themselves. Next, please. For increasing safety and establishing boundaries, this is really where we're talking about having those internet boundaries, which is crucial for them, as well as emotional and physical boundaries, um, making sure we keep to those. And we do a red light, yellow light, green light attack activity with the kids. Next, please. And then number eight, safe and positive love and communication. We talk a lot about healthy relationships versus unhealthy relationships. Um, this is huge with kids because when you're really talking to them about what do they think is a healthy versus unhealthy, a lot of times they have no idea. Um, so it's really helpful to get this, this piece in um, for the kids to make sure that they are set up, set up to succeed and build those healthy relationships. And that's actually all I have. Um, Terry, I think I did really good on time. At least I hope I did. <laughs> Um, and I will put my contact information in the box as well. All right.
Thank you so much, Bailey. Um, wow, that's a lot of information. You're doing some amazing things. We do have a few questions in the chat box that we can um, that we can address if you don't mind. Okay. Okay. So um, here's a question: Outside of our own homes and personal lives, his children are grown and on their own already. What can we do to help the situation? Um, we are always looking for um, people to become a part of our speakers bureau if you feel so inclined. Um, we are constantly getting um, requests for schools, organizations. Um, we just did the Citizens Police Academy. Um, if you feel inclined to help with that, we're, we're certainly looking for, for people to help with that. Um, what else you can do is just kind of having those open conversations with whatever organization you're a part of. Um, if you're doing volunteer work, um, anywhere you're volunteering at, just kind of having, hey, what do you think human trafficking is, is usually a great open, open liner for that. And, um Somebody also asked, how does Medina County compare to adjoining counties in this regard? It's a great question. Um, I know a lot of people are always asking for specific numbers on things. Um, and I know Hope and Healing is on. So if you guys want to jump in, you're more than welcome to. Uh, we have, every year we see, we see kids at least. Um, I know I'm working with at least 12 this year. Um, that are minors that have been victims of human trafficking. We're working right now on just trying to get them to identify that they actually are a victim. Um, that's been the biggest boundary um, and hurdle that we've, we've come across. We have worked with adults as well. Um, the Children's Center has called me a couple of times now saying, hey, somebody showed up at our doorstep. Um, they need services, they need help. So we've, we've helped them um, get situated with that as well. As far as actual numbers, um, we need victims to come forward on that. And the biggest hurdle really is them just identifying that they are a victim. You know, Hope and Healing has had some people come forward with them as well. Okay. All right, Bailey, we've got somebody who's interested in becoming a volunteer. She wants to know how she can become a, a volunteer. Um, if you just, I put my contact information, if you just either send me a text message or um, email me. I can put you on my list of um, emails to go out. Yeah, it looked like there are a number of opportunities to volunteer, like the mentoring and everything mm -hmm. and the different events, yeah. Um, I've got another question here. Um, is there a way to know when the information is presented to Medina High School? I'm guessing it might be somebody who's tied to Medina in some way. <laughs> yeah. Um, we are still working out our schedule for that. Um, we've kind of tried to, we, we typically like to do it in person just because if some of the kids, we, we dive a little bit more in depth with it, um, but if the kids have any triggers um, or any sort of conversations they wanna have afterwards, um, it's a lot easier for somebody to be in the classroom. So we've kind of been trying to work out the kinks with that and doing some test runs with it being virtual as well as in person. Um, the virtual is a little bit harder just because we can't always see what kids are thinking. Um, we can't really read body languages. It's a lot harder um, for us to do. And when kids are wearing masks as well, I can't really see, you know, the, the clenched jaw. Um, so we're, we're working out the kinks with that. Um, as of right now, I don't have a set date for that. Right now, I just have um, Buckeye and I believe Cloverleaf are what we have set schedules right now. All right, I've got another one here. Um, does your organization have any literature that, when I say your organization, you're like part of three organizations. Um, does your organization have any literature that we could potentially pass out to our clients? I serve primarily low to moderate income families and would love to provide them with information and resources to educate them. Absolutely. Um, send me a text message and we can meet up. That's absolutely. So again, she's got her contact information in the uh, in the chat box for everybody. So, um, and then I have another question here. Um, any good success or survivor stories to share? 
That's a good yeah. question. Yes, um, that's, I love that question. <laughs> um, yes, I actually, I have quite a few. Um, one kid who actually came through the Child Advocacy Center, um, we, she was just a tough cookie. Um, she ended up being a victim of human trafficking, having that time to process it um, away from the center. Uh, unfortunately, she did not want to engage in uh, mental health services at that time, which is, is fine. Um, so we do check-ins with that. And she actually became one of my kiddos um, through case management with alternative paths. So our paths did cross again. Um, and I'm happy to report she is um, volunteering. She is looking at getting a job after high school um, and doing the adults program through the Career Center for Cosmetology. So I do, yeah, yeah, okay. it's been great. Um, we had, I mean, just quite a few. Um, if anybody is interested too in the mentorship program, um, our actual mentor is a survivor and I will not go in depth in her story just because it is not mine to share. Um, but she has been an active part of the coalition now for about a year and a half. Um, she did her first speaking engagement actually last October um, at her very first human trafficking event and did phenomenal. Um, she was able to get in touch with the mentorship program and then she actually just spoke and told her whole story at the Nova conference in Orlando, Florida. And she is going for her master's right now in social work and she is a case manager with alternative paths right now. So she has a amazing story, amazing yeah. story. Yeah. Okay, well, it would be nice to see, you know, um, more of those success stories. And I think, you know, oftentimes you hear that, you know, if you can speak about your experience that also helps in your healing um, cause you're also helping other people as well to get through what they've been through themselves. So that's, that's great. Yeah, um, when, um, when she shared her story at uh, salon Evangeline, actually, we did a training with them. She had a, um, a hairstylist come up and talk to her about her story. So, um, and that was the first time she had disclosed to anybody. So it's, it's really having that open line of communication. Yeah. So she is helping somebody else. That's great by sharing her story. All right, um, I don't have any other questions. Are there any other questions out there? I mean, Bailey, you've given us so much information. Thank you so much. Any other questions out there? I know there was a comment in the chat box um, from one of our participants and, and I, I actually kind of resonated too. And it, you know, my eyebrows raised too when you mentioned that uh, the percentage of boys that are you know males that are, are being human trafficked now, um, so. And then we've got a comment here. Great presentation, Bailey. So thank you very much. Thank um, you. And so uh, thank you everybody for participating today. Bailey, thank you so much for your time and tell Moose we said hello. I will. And um, just to kind of encourage um, the group here today, we do have, this is uh, one of a series of webinars that we're offering this fall to kind of celebrate Domestic Violence Month and uh, Anti-Bullying Month. So um, our next session, and we've got the, uh, the two speakers on our call today is are from the uh, Hope and Healing, which is also the Better Women's Shelter of Summit in Medina County. So both Megan Vermillion and Anna Marie uh, from the Better Women's Shelter. Oh, there they are, Anna Marie's waving. I, I was gonna attempt your last name, but I'm like, I'm gonna butcher it, so. <laughs> but they'll be speaking uh, on October 12th at a, our next Lunch and Learn in the series on domestic violence. And um, they'll be providing us with the current situation in Medina County, as well as providing us with uh, resources that are available to victims. So both of you, thank you for participating today. And uh, you can register on our website uh, for up and under upcoming events for the domestic violence webinar on October 12th from noon to one. So thank you very much, everybody. And again, Bailey's information is in the chat box if you'd like to jot that down or copy and paste that yourself. And um, hopefully we'll see you on October 12th. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.